Okay. So uh, what I want to start talking about here today in terms, in terms of how things progress is that uh, we have the rise of new scriptures, the development of new scriptures that bring in new teachings and with it um, the way things get systematized in terms of the caste system okay, in India. And so what we've seen so far, you know, first of all, of course, we had the Rig Veda and then all the appendices added on to it. And we see a major shift of teaching from religion in the very beginning to how it develops by the time we get to the Upanishads. So there's almost like two different religions here, right? And in the Upanishads, what we had is this teaching of that you need to leave society, go into the forest, full-time on meditation and yoga to realize your true self as none other than the supreme being brahman right and uh and so that is a path you know if that was the whole of hinduism as religion right uh it's extremely limited because you know if everybody did that society would collapse there would be no food that would be produced there'd be no children being born you know everybody would renounce their worldly life uh become sexually celibate and uh and there'd be no use begging for food because nobody would be growing it and uh you know producing it right so, so it's incomplete as a religious system. It can only be partial. It can only be uh, applicable to certain people at a certain place at a certain time in life. And so this is exactly what will happen. There will be those renegade priests who left society and thought, no, I don't want to waste my time doing these rituals to serve the community, but I want to send this power we're tapping into, right? And they go full time into the forest, living a secluded life, practicing yoga meditation and seeking spiritual enlightenment. However, not all priests did that. There were those who remained in society, kept doing the rituals. And they're the ones that start creating some texts, some new scriptures, so to speak, uh, that teach the importance and the religious value of staying in society, of getting married, having a family, going to work, producing the food, producing the goods, keeping the economy going, <laughs> all right? And that that has a religious value and a religious purpose. Purpose. And they do this under the concept that everyone has a particular dharma, a duty and obligation in life. Okay, dharma, D H A R M A. Uh, and they're going to put together these scriptures, these texts called the Dharma Shastras. Okay, the Dharma Shastras. And let me just see if this works. Okay, if you can see this. Um, I had, you know, a handout in class that I would normally give, and I try to take a picture of it to upload in here, it just didn't work, you know, I don't know, I'm not too good at this techie stuff. And uh, yeah, and so anyways, I tried writing this out, and so I'm wondering if this is readable to you. It looks reversed to me, but I'll find out if this works. But what's going to happen is they're going to develop new scriptures, new teachings, and they're going to kind of synthesize it all as there being different ways, different paths to attain salvation. So the first path we've seen, uh, the fundamental scripture for the basis of it are the Upanishads, right? And they're going to define this as, this is the way of knowledge, jnana marga, okay, jnana marga. Uh, that this is a path of knowing your true self as Brahman, the supreme being, okay? And so there's a very difficult path, it's elitist, is not for everybody, only for the few that are more intellectually, philosophically oriented, okay, who would seek this path, right? And so, however, uh, not everybody could do that. It's not suitable to everybody and would lead to social chaos and, and a total breakdown of society. So the remaining priests devise what they call the Dharma Shastras, as you can see there, right? Composed from around 500 BC onward that they start being composed. And what they do is they delineate the idea that everybody has particular social and religious duties and obligations to fulfill in life, that that is their dharma, okay? Their social and religious obligations and duties. And that dharma is going to be determined by the social class they're born into, along with the stage of life that they're, born, that they're at, okay? Okay, the stage of life and their social class. Those are the two key things that determine your dharma, your duties and obligations. 
And one of the key texts here of these, the word Shastra means treatises. And of these many Dharma treatises, okay, that teach on the Dharma, the most important are the laws of Manu. Okay, the laws of Manu, generally his dates are 200 BC to 100 CE, okay? And, and there, it's interesting, is that you have the story that once upon a time in the ancient past, there was a flood that destroyed the whole planet. And knowing ahead of time that there's going to be a flood, this man named Manu uh, builds a big boat and puts all these animals on the boat along with his family. And as the flood came and destroyed the planet and destroyed all the people and all living things, uh, then eventually Vishnu, the great god Vishnu, we'll talk more about Vishnu in a bit, uh, comes to earth in the form of a fish, all right, takes, becomes an avatar, incarnates as a fish, and pulls the boat up onto like uh, a mountaintop in a sense. And uh, as the waters start receding, so they could get off the boat onto this mountaintop. And so the animals and his family get off, and we are the ancestors or the descendants of Manu. And then he then comprised, uh, comprised these laws that people are to follow and live by, okay, the laws of Manu. And these are basically a code of ethics that we are to follow, uh, our social and religious rituals, duties, and obligations that we are to fulfill, okay? And as I mentioned, they are then determined according to the social class that we're born into and the stage of life that we're at. And so, as I had intimated way back, coming in with the Aryans in the very beginning, they bring with them their social class structure. They themselves, the Aryans, had basically the priests, their priests, the Brahmin priests, okay? So they're going to become a main social class, the upper one, the, the number one one, <laughs> the most important, the holiest, the purest. The whole class caste system is based on the idea of spiritual purity. The more spiritually pure you are, okay, due to past lives, that is what will result in your being born in an upper class. So if you're born in a Brahmin family, that means you're of highest spiritual purity uh, as a result of lots of good karma from your past lives, okay? Then underneath the Brahmin, the priestly class, we have the Kshatriya class. These are the rulers, the warriors, the ones that are responsible for government in society. They are the second class. And there was a bit of a tension between those two as to who's number one. <laughs> but the priests want up, okay, that religion is supreme. And so uh, we have the Kshatriya class, okay? They are the second one. And I've got a little chart here, and hopefully you can read it. And then uh, the third are the Vaishya. The Vaishya are... And this, again, goes back to the Aryans. So the Aryans, they had their priests, they had their rulers, their chieftains, those who were leading the tribe, as well as their warriors. Okay, So they're then going to become the future kings, rulers, princes, uh, soldiers, those who are responsible for the domain of government Okay, in society. Then you had the common people. right? The commoners, they were, they were the herdsmen. They're the ones who looked after all the cattle. And so their area of responsibility is the economy, the economic side of things, the production of food and goods, right? And so they're going to become basically the ones who own the farmland, all right, uh, would have whatever animals there would be, but produce the crops, okay? Because again, you know, most, a lot of Hindus eventually become vegetarian, a lot of them. And um, so they largely be responsible for owning the land, producing the goods in terms of food, and then uh, factories in terms of production of goods, literally. So they become the merchants and the traders, everything involved with the economy, right? So those are the upper three classes. Those were the Aryans that come into India. Then the Dravidians, the, the indigenous people were then their servants. They're the ones that would do the manual labor. They're the ones who would be working the soil on the farm and planting the seeds and, and harvesting the crops, right? Uh, they're the ones who would be doing a lot of the manual work of, you know, creating goods like pots and uh, clothing and working in a factory and, you know, making carpets and who knows whatever, producing the goods, doing a lot of the manual labor, okay? That would be the sudras, the sudras, they would be the servants. And then underneath them, you have the outcasts. Uh, they become known as the untouchables because it was held that they would be the most spiritually defiling. Any contact with an outcast, an untouchable, any kind of contact, even 
directly physically, but or even a bit of spit, even their shadow touching you, uh, whatever, so they'd often have to kind of cover their mouth. Um, it would be spiritually defiling. You'd have to go through some kind of cleansing ritual, okay, because they're the most impure. And as impure, they're the ones that do impure work, like carrying dead corpses, dealing with dead animals in some way. So that would mean working with leather because that's a piece, of, part of a dead animal. So any kind of contact with corpses is contaminating. Uh, the cleaning of sewage, uh, sweeping the streets, you know, anything was seen as sort of dirty work, defiling work, they're the ones that would do it. And those then become uh, the four main classes and then the outcasts, right? Well, then the word for class is Varna. Okay, and I might just have to just somehow type this all up again because I don't know if you can see this here. But the word Varna is for social class, okay? And again, there's a difference between the word class and caste. A lot of texts don't even make that distinction, but it is an important one. There are only four main social classes, but there are literally thousands of castes. And a caste is a subcategory of a class, right? And I'll talk more about that in a sec. Okay, so just hold on to that. But the word for class is varna, and varna literally means color, and it was based on skin color. So the upper three classes of the Aryans, they were fair-skinned. Okay, uh, and the sudras, who were their servants, were the dark-skinned. Okay, and so again, just that's tied in even with the word class, right? So you can kind of see where this comes from, the Aryans. Now, uh, so you can see here that the three main social classes, right? And then here are the sudras that are the servants, and then down here are the outcasts or the untouchables. And then Mahatma Gandhi held that there should they should be renamed the children of God. Okay, the children of God, Harijan. So he changed the name, just so you know, okay? But historically, that's, again, they've been called the untouchables, but he wanted to stop the discrimination against them, right? So anyways, um, so what happens here is that in terms of the teachings in the Dharma, defining your Dharma is determined by the social class you're born into and the stage of life that you're at. And there are four basic stages of life people of the upper three classes will go through. So this only applies to the upper three classes. And historically, it's only applied to the boys, the males of those upper three classes. Okay, they're expected to kind of go through the system, even though women do to some degree, but not to the same extent. So the first stage of life is that of a student stage. Okay, and let me, uh, I don't know, I hate holding and talking this at the same time, but let me just kind of put this down. So the student stage of life. Now here, this involves an initiation ritual and is geared just for the boys. And depending on if they're Brahmin, Kshatriya or Vaishya, uh, it would, the age would vary from eight to 12 years old. They would go through initiation ritual where the head would be shaved, they'd wear special clothing and, uh, and they would then receive, what's most important is a sacred cord, this rope that they would wear over their shoulder and around them. And after this initiation ritual, they are now a full-fledged member of their class, okay? They have been initiated into their social class, and therefore they're seen as being undergone, having undergone a second birth. They are the twice born. They have been born physically the first time, and now they've been born spiritually into their social class, okay? So as a boy, before this initiation, if they were born in a Brahmin family, technically, they weren't officially a Brahmin yet. They're only now, after this initiation ritual, are they now a full-fledged Brahmin. Before this, technically, they'd be Sudra, okay, a Sudra, a servant, okay? Uh, and that applies also to the Kshatriya and the Vaishya, all right? Uh, it's only after this initiation that they are a full-fledged member of that social class, okay? So that's a key thing is that getting that sacred cord and they'd wear this for the rest of their life unless they decide to renounce all of this, which I'll talk about in a sec. Okay. So that's the first stage, right? Is this initiation ritual. Then in this stage, the first stage of life, you have a goal, a focus. And the goal at that stage of life is to learn your dharma, <laughs> to learn what your duties and obligations are. And so then that involves schooling, 
you know, so you'd go to school, uh, you, of course, you know, there's involved some, especially today, modern education, right? But again, historically in the past, it wasn't like Western education, okay? Uh, it was more of a religious, uh, moral, and social kind of education that they go through. But you learn all of your ritual duties and obligations. You know what your dharma is. And that would vary from, you know, if you're a Brahmin priest or kshatriya, working in government in some way or whatever that would entail, or a Vaishya. Okay, they all have different duties and obligations according to their social class. Okay, so your goal at this point at the student stage is to learn your Dharma. Then you go into the second stage of life, okay, which is to become a householder, which entails you get married. Okay, and it's always an arranged marriage according to your social class. Okay, so it's an arranged marriage that will happen. I'll talk more about that in a bit too, in terms of castes. Okay, so there'll be an arranged marriage that will take place. And so then you, uh, your duty and goal and focus at that point is to be successful as a householder. And so this is where these are your two goals, Artha and Kama. Okay, seeking material success. So it could be seeking wealth. It could be seeking power. You know, if you're a royal class, you know, being a good king a good ruler right or if you're in business being successful in your business running that farm having it really produce a great cop crop okay uh, being successful at whatever it is that you do in life right so attaining material success in whatever format that looks for you and then second goal at this stage is karma which is the pleasures of life which entails the arts all of the arts from dance poetry music okay um literature, uh, drama, all the various things involved with the arts, and but also sexual pleasure, okay? And that's why you have the Kama Sutras, the text on sexual pleasure, <laughs> okay? And, and here you can see what this is all about at this stage of life. What they're doing is they're providing a religious uh, sanctification, uh, an emphasis, that it is your religious duty to engage this life now, right? To be successful materially, physically successful, and to enjoy this life, enjoy your sexuality, enjoy the arts and music and dance and all that. Uh, so it's very much affirming this world, right? And engaging it fully, right? Because from the Upanishads teaching, it's like, pff, you wanna leave this world. Uh, you want to detach from it. Uh, you want to renounce all physical desires, right? You wouldn't waste your time in terms of dance and music and all that. You just meditate and want to become one with God, <laughs> right? So it totally is all about renouncing everything in this world. And so what they're doing here, these priests, is they're providing a religious value to the everyday life here on planet Earth, right? Okay, hopefully you get that. that that's a key thing. And it's a beautiful thing, right? Just to say, you know what, there's a right time and place for different things. And so right now your focus is on getting married, having a family, being successful in work, at work, and enjoying this world, <laughs> enjoying your physicality. Okay. All right. So, so those, that's why there's different goals at different stages of life. Okay. Well, then after you've done the whole thing, you know, you've done your game, you know, you've, you've had your children, you're now seeing grandchildren, your business is successful or whatever it is that you've got going, uh, you've made your achievements in this world, you start making a transition into retirement, right? This is a transitional phase, right? Uh, starting to withdraw from this world uh, so that you know, you, you, you'll get, you pass on your business or whatever it is to your children, your son. He's now running the business. And, uh, you know, your children are all grown up and they have their kids, right? So they're all be able to look after themselves. They don't really need you that much anymore. So you're starting to withdraw. So what would be very common, traditionally, you would now leave the house of the whole gang <laughs> where everybody lives and maybe live in a little hut not far away. Okay, just a very small little place that you would live on your own. Maybe have your wife come with you, but you make a vow of celibacy. And you would just dedicate yourself more and more to spiritual practice. 
okay? Spiritual practice, more and more meditation, yoga, study under guru, go maybe go to an ashram, uh, whatever you want to just focus more and more on the spiritual, right? You haven't made a total cut yet, but you're, it's a transitional phase, okay? From leaving this world to focusing more on the spiritual, okay? So that's the thing. It's a transitional phase. So it doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, the goal here is just making this transition from all of this to ultimately this one, which is total release, okay, from future rebirth, right? So it's kind of a transitional phase. And so when you're ready, you would then take and make the final leap and make a complete renunciation of this life, this world, your past identity all engagement with this world and become a sannyasi sannyasi uh, a renunciate is another term i maybe should have written that down there renunciate okay i'll uh, get a pen here i'm just gonna write that down. okay um where you renounce everything of this life okay. renunciate can you see that there where is it here there it is renunciate okay where you literally, what can often happen is all of a sudden you just disappear. Your family think, oh, where do you go? And you know, maybe you say goodbye, maybe not. But boom, you leave your family, you leave the village, you, you leave your little city, wherever it is that you're from. You have taken off your sacred cord that was a part of your social class identity. Boom. I am no longer Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, whatever. I'm beyond caste. You renounce that. You renounce your birth name, you know, your material, physical name of Linda Christensen, and you would take on a spiritual name, okay? Um, and uh, you would just renounce all possessions, just have maybe a begging bowl and your clothing and a staff or what have you, and you would just wander and go maybe from temple to temple or, or maybe hang out at a certain place somewhere else and just to get your food and just focus 100% on spiritual liberation, seeking moksha, release from future rebirth, right? And so you don't want to talk about your past. You totally cut ties with your past history, with your family, your name, your identity. It's like, boom, no more. And you're just undoing all of that. And you don't even think about it, talk about it, right? And you're just focusing on seeking that enlightenment, release from future rebirth. That's the way of the sannyasi, a renunciate. Their goal here is moksha, okay? Release from rebirth, all right? So hopefully that makes sense. And so what can happen here is there will be some who will go from student's A stage to a renunciate stage, a sannyasi, becoming an ascetic someone who's renounced the worldly life, the householder life, and say, forget it. I don't even want to get married, have kids, and do the whole game. Right? I just want to, from student stage, go directly into being a uh, sannyasi, a renunciate, okay? and, uh, or ascetic. And there are those who will do that. Right? So, so this is kind of the map of how this works, of how the uh, priests try to incorporate that, like, okay, yes, you can seek that release from rebirth. They want to affirm the teachings of the Upanishads. But what they're recommending is you do that after you've lived the life of a householder, raised a family, done your business, been successful in this world. It has the right place and time at the end of your life. Okay. And that's how they kind of integrate it. Right. And this is one thing Hinduism does is we'll always try to integrate and bring into a bit of a synthesis, new teachings and new movements and new trends and tries to harmonize and integrate it all. Right. And, uh, and that's also then why Hinduism can have such diversity within it and become quite sectarian <laughs> in the sense that you'll have your choice as to which way you want to go and how you want to work with this stuff. Okay, uh, that's what's very distinctive about Hinduism, and it's been its strength, all right, that it could survive uh, the thousands of years it has, especially in the face of, especially when the Muslims come in there and, and, co and conquer most of India, and like within 100 years, something like 20 million uh, Hindus and Indian people of India were killed at that time, right, around 1000 uh, CE. It was devastating, so much destroyed. Buddhism was totally wiped out at that time. 
right? Buddhism was totally destroyed. University that was existent there, a lot of the uh, texts were destroyed. And if they hadn't been translated from scan Sanskrit into Chinese or Tibetan, we'd hardly know, we'd hardly have anything of Mahayana Buddhism, okay? It only continued on in China and Tibet. Uh, the very, Tibetan Buddhism, its own tradition and in, within China got wiped out. In, in India, it only still continued to exist way south in Sri Lanka, okay, because the Mughals didn't conquer that region. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, it's this diversity that has been its strength and uh, has sustained uh, Hinduism, I think, probably all these uh, millennia. Now, so that's the four social classes. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, your, your dharma is determined by the stage of life you're in and your social class that you're born. And it's all really geared around the males of those upper three classes, okay? Uh, the sudras, you know, they're just basically the servants of the three. And then the outcasts, they do basically was seen as defiling work. And so, yeah, now as mentioned, castes. So what happens here is that over time, caste developed. Caste is a subgroup within class. So say you've got the larger social class of Brahmins. Well, what happens over time? Because of you know, marriage arrangements, arranged marriages, uh, hierarchies start to develop within each social class. That this Brahmin family here, oh, they were they they were very privileged uh, Brahmins. Uh, they were always very wealthy, uh, very much associated with rulers and kings in the past. Um, famous names and scholars and authors and of books and whatever were of this particular class. Whereas this Brahmin family here, oh, they have a bad reputation. <laughs> you know, there were those in there that really the scandalous things they did and and. Uh, they were crooks and corrupt and you know they've got a bad reputation and and so what you'll find happening is subcategories start to exist that this brahmin family is way up on the totem pole and this one is way down and others are in between <laughs> and so as people start arranging marriages right uh that they kind of get delineated and they then become subclasses and they're technically called castes so within the social class of Brahmins, you might have a thousand different Brahmin castes. Okay, you guys with me here? This is what happens, right? And so there's a lot of diversity within each class and all based on through intermarriage as to who is superior, who is inferior, you know, their history. Perhaps there was, you know, some intermarriages between, well, this Brahmin married this Kshatriya or Vaishya over here or whatever. You'll have that kind of thing. So that kind of lowers their status. Um, you'll have this sort of thing happening. Okay. So that's why there's different castes. And so historically, what we find in India is that the legal system wasn't as what we're used to here in the West, uh, of, of an equal law for all people, that all people have to follow the law and there's, you know, the same rules for everybody. There in India, traditionally, you had caste laws. Uh, the laws varied according to caste. Um, so the punishment for different crimes would vary between one caste and another. So that, say, for example, um, it was a worse sin to kill a cow than it would have been to have killed someone who was an outcast, okay? And so the punishment for killing a cow versus an, a, a, an outcast or the, what was called the untouchable, that that would be a worse sin, a worse crime to kill a cow. Um, as opposed to, but boy, if you did something to a Brahmin priest, oh, the punishment would be much more severe than if you did this to a lower class or to a sudra. Right? So there'd be variations in the, in the legal system. This is historically what's been the case. And, um, and of course, you know, there's restrictions. The thing, key thing about caste to remember is uh, your occupation, what you're allowed to do for a profession was largely something that became inherited. It was in the family. You were expected to fulfill this profession. There wasn't a freedom, a freedom of choice of what your occupation would be. It became inherited and entrenched, right? This is a key thing that's happened. So to make, again, just to make the final point here, 
is that in recent times, officially uh, in India, they've made it a, a, a rule, a law, that any kind of discrimination based on caste is not to be allowed, that there should be freedom of occupation, uh, equal law to equal people. That is officially what is to be the case. But yet, that isn't always what actually happens, all right? But, but this is the, the official stance of the government, is um, equality and no discrimination based on caste, right? But again, it's hard to change these things. It's been so entrenched. And we find in cities it breaks down more, but in a lot of more isolated villages, you still very much have the caste system in operation in a, in a more traditional way. Okay, so it will vary in terms of location. Okay. So hopefully, oh, let me just um, share a screen here. I did have one slide that, um, now where do I go here? Google Chrome, share, and um, uh, which one is it, this one? Yeah, here we go. And I'm going to just make this a bit bigger. Okay, so you can see this. <clears throat> this is the only nice little slide that looks half decent. Uh, and that again, as I already said, based on the teachings of the Dharma Shastras, and the most important of these Shastras are the laws of Manu. We have the development, and not just the development of the caste system, but the teachings regarding what your duties and obligations are according to the social class you're born into. Okay? Yeah. And there you've got just a nice little pyramid. And those are the four stages of life, student, householder, semi-retired and withdrawal kind of state, and then the sannyasi renunciate, right? All that I kind of mentioned, okay? All right, so hopefully this all makes sense, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's all good for you, and I will leave it at there point for now, okay? All right.